all right, all right. Message received. I realized that we have not been making how to run Dragon of Ice by our peak videos, probably at the rate in which uh, we should have. Uh, it's not as if we haven't been doing anything else as Guerrilla Riot Games. Thank you so much for checking out the rest of our content uh, because really that's what Josh and I are trying to do. We're going to try and help you and your friends get the most out of your games. However, here we are. I'm making a Nomengard guide and um, this one's kind of out there. So let's take a quick look. Hello there, I'm Jake from J&J &J Tabletop, and I have run the Dragon of Ice Spire Peak Adventure, and you can find that playthrough right here on this channel. Along the way, I made some mistakes, I did some things that I liked, but overall, I have to admit that even though this is like a, like a beginner adventure, I had a ton of fun doing this, much more so than I thought I would have. So I'd highly recommend you check out that playthrough, but if you're just interested in learning about the Nomengard quest in particular, this video is for you. And uh, if you're going to be a player, I mean, obviously there's going to be some spoilers and maybe you're into that sort of thing. But uh, either way, I think uh, I trust you to make a good decision for you on that. Now, full transparency, I actually haven't run this particular part of the Dragon of Ice Spire Peak. However, I did prepare for it in case my players did decide to go on it. Uh, although I have to say, after I put together notes for this adventure, I probably originally underprepared for it. So I... I think this video actually is going to be very helpful for anyone that likes to kind of have that more loosey-goosey style uh, because I like to leave the door open for that, but I also like to kind of plan some of those moments and make it a little more deliberate. So first things first, as the name of this adventure clearly implies, this is all about gnomes. So concerning gnomes, if you're not very familiar, know this. They're, they're just over the top. They're overly curious. They're full of energy and enthusiasm, and they express their individual personalities in their appearance, whether that's their clothing, their hairstyle, whatever it may be. So during the course of this adventure, I highly encourage you to lean into that as much as possible. I mean, when it comes to gnomes, it's really kind of what you see is what you get, and that always messes with players. And of course, it goes without saying that you can deviate from any racial or lineage norm. Uh, this is just gnomish culture as a whole, so which I just think is fun, and this adventure is zany, so... I, I really feel like that's how it's designed to be played at the table. So as a people that even though gnomes do live upwards of 500 years, they try to squeeze every last drop out of their lives that they can. They're, they're just trying to enjoy themselves. They're, they're curious. They try to uh, find new ways that things work, understand how things go. They, they're not afraid to make mistakes. And in fact, they sometimes throw caution to the wind because they know they're going to learn something when they try something new. And that's an incredibly fun trope to lean into. They're jokesters, particularly puns. So anytime you can fit a pun in this adventure, just, just do it. And they laugh at their own mistakes. They, they're not so into themselves or so full of themselves that they can't, uh, that they don't have a good sense of humor. And of course, that isn't to say that they don't have like a full range of emotion. So like, you know, when something sad happens, you know, it's okay to have them be sad. In order to maybe help sum up a few things, I prepared a few quotes from Thomas Edison that I think uh, may help you understand gnomes a little bit more. Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. Just because something doesn't do what you planned it to do doesn't mean it's useless. I never did a day's work in my life. It was all fun. To invent, you need a good imagination and a pile of junk. Results. By man, I've gotten a lot of results. I know several thousand things that won't work. So now that we're in that gnomish mood, let's take a look at the quest card that the adventure provides. A clan of reclusive rock gnomes resides in a small network of caves in the mountains to the southeast. The gnomes of Nomengard are known for their magical inventions. They might have something with which to defeat the dragon. Get whatever you can from them. If you bring back something useful and don't want to keep it for yourselves, Townmaster Harbin Wester will pay you 50 gold pieces for it. So the caves of Nomengard are carved into the base of a mountain southeast of Phandalin around a narrow waterfall. And these gnomes are, uh, they're not really the most successful inventors. And in fact, they really don't leave Nomengard very often. 
uh, and they survive by eating the mushrooms that kind of grow around the cave. And uh, these mushrooms are kind of on like the magical version of PEDs. Maybe you've heard of it before. It's called uh, wild magic, which we're going to get into a little bit more later because uh, gnomes, chaos, fun, silly. It all fits. Two gnomes named Nurkli and Korbaz are the two kings that rule over the vast kingdom of Nomengard, banning 20 gnomes, including the two kings. So Korbaz has kind of lost it and is currently keeping Nurkli as his prisoner um, because he perceives danger. And the other gnomes are aware of this, but they really kind of just don't know how to handle that. In the last week, or as the Forgotten Realms like to call it, Ten day, two other gnomes have been eaten by a shape-changing monster that you and I are more familiar with called a Mimic. So even though Korbaz has kind of lost his mind, he is right that there is danger in Nomengard, but because he's a little bit of a lunatic right now, it's kind of hard to get information out of him. So Korbaz has locked himself and Nurkli in their bedroom Kind of in the hopes that the Mimic will eat enough gnomes that it will be full and leave. And so in order for Korobaz to regain his sanity, the group simply must present evidence of some kind that the Mimic has been destroyed. Whether they want to make that real evidence in some way, manufacture it, lie, intimidate, I, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just there's some mechanics later on that we're going to get into as to how to actually make sure that uh, Korbaz is convinced. I would just let the players figure that part out. And if they're creative with it, great. But uh, that's kind of what we're dealing with here in Nomengard. Now, in your adventure pack, there is a section called Mystery Monster. And I think there's some useful information here that you can use. I would use your imagination as to which mundane objects the mimic could transform themselves into because I think that's, you know, that's just more fun. But one thing I would highly recommend is to consider some kind of a timeline as to how often this mimic may devour another gnome. So as funny and as zany as this adventure kind of can be, I think if you wanted to take it to like this horror place, I think it actually works. I would recommend maybe like once a day, like usually like after overnight happens, another gnome goes missing and I would just try and have it make sense. So like if you're disguising the mimic as like a hutch or like a, you know, a cabinet in the kitchen, it's probably going to kill someone that goes to the kitchen often. That sort of thing. Now this section also gives you the option to let the mimic be a variant that can speak common. And uh, sometimes, you know, Players at your table won't want to engage in combat and they'd rather find a nonviolent solution. And this would be a way to go about doing that. They give you some mechanics. I personally think that could be a little anticlimactic, but if your players are into that sort of thing, who am I to judge? One thing personally that I would add to the mimic is give it the ability to cast Dimension Door once per day and give it, it's very familiar with the environment. So it could go to any room that it sees fit or at least that it's been to. That's significant. But the way I would explain that this mimic can do that is that one of the two gnomes that it's already eaten was, say, wearing a cape of the mountebank or a ring of the mountebank, whatever item you feel might fit best. But it can help up the stakes a little bit. It can help have the mimic survive a first encounter and then kind of make it so that you have to you have to kind of get it twice, if that makes sense. And I think that the ability to cast Dimension Door once per day is hardly game-breaking, but it can really make your players feel cool once they figure this part out and then gain that ability later on. Think about it. If you could teleport 500 feet and take someone with you, you open the door for some fun hero moments. And uh, Josh and I actually have a video that we made on this channel called How to Award Magic Items. And... Uh, I think you should check that out. Another way that you could up the stakes a bit is you can add additional monsters. I mean, between things like crazy inventors, wild magic, I think it's totally reasonable that there could be animated suits of armor or a rug of smothering or any other item that you think might be fun to homebrew for your own game. Especially if you feel like your your players, they really crave more combat and maybe, maybe they killed the mimic really quickly and you want to just keep things going a little bit. I think that's a wonderful way to go about it. And it's just, 
use your own discretion, kind of feel the table out, feel the adventure out, see how much time you have, all the things that could go into a decision like that. I think that's a great way to make it better. Normally for these videos, I do like to kind of have a section on NPCs all to itself, but there's a lot of them here. So I'm just going to go over these new characters as we get to each section of Nomengard. And uh, as far as like quest goals are concerned, really it's just find something cool and bring it back to town. So really it's kind of however the players are gonna feel about everything. And I can't imagine that if you used my idea with a cloak of the mountebank to be returned, I, I can't imagine that they would wanna give that to the town master, but if they did, I would certainly give them more than 50 gold for it, maybe like 200 or more, you know, whatever it is. But um, I, I highly doubt that they would give that up. So on to Nomengard itself. Let's talk about some of the features that are involved kind of in all of Nomengard, and then we'll go into some of the specific locations. First off, in Nomengard, the ceilings throughout are about seven feet high and they're flat. It's actually kind of cramped. The doors are made of wood fitted with rusty iron handles and hinges. A locked door can be opened with a successful DC 10 dexterity check using thieves tools. A locked door can be forced open as an action with a successful DC 15 athletics check. Secret doors are made of stone and blend in with the surrounding stonework. Finding a secret door requires a search of the wall and a successful DC 10 perception check. The light here, uh, all the caves are illuminated by hanging oil lanterns attached to rope and pulley mechanisms that make it easy for the gnomes to lower the lanterns and refill them with oil. So the caves of Nomengard actually echo with the roar of a nearby waterfall. The sound is so loud that gnomes and visitors must shout to be heard unless there's a closed door between them and the waterfall. And of course, there is also a section on the wild magic that exists in Nomengard, and I think I would use this table as often as you want. You can roll if you want, you can ignore it if you want, you can add to it if you want. In fact, kind of like I said earlier about Wild Magic creating some of these animated objects, I think it's a great way to add some more spice and flavor to this adventure. And uh, by the way, that would happen if the gnomes cast a leveled spell just as much as it would happen for a character. So if we go in numerical order as we read the map, I think the first place of significance to go over is the kitchen, and that's section G4. Now here in the kitchen, there are five gnomes. Joy Bell, Dimble, Banana, Up and Down, and Turve Around. Now all of the gnomes here in the kitchen, which those are such good names, very gnomish, uh, all of these gnomes don't really like talking about what's going on with Korbaz and Nurkli. Uh, so anything that happens to be of any significance, they're like, uh, you, you need to talk to Fibblestib and Dabbledob. Again, great names, uh, but they're found in section G11. So the adventure says that these gnomes never leave the kitchen, but to me, that's very much take it or leave it, depending on what goals you have for the story. Uh, especially if you want to have, say, maybe one work the overnight shift to prep food for the next day. Maybe that's when the mimic comes and strikes a poor, innocent, suspecting up and down or turf around. <laughs> Mixed names, though. But in terms of role playing this whole interaction, I would lean into anything that's going to be fun for you. Maybe you want it to be a little more subtle and a little more realistic, and you think about maybe you watch like Downton Abbey or something like that. Or perhaps you want to be over the top and you think of like the British baking show or maybe something with Gordon Ramsay in it. I don't know. If you have any good ideas for like kitchen stories or anything like that, let me know in the comments section. On to section G8, the barrel crabs. This whole thing is just basically magical forklifts or squeeze presses. I don't know if any of you have ever worked in a warehouse, but I used to in big machines that would move these big boxes. Anyways, this is lighthearted fun and kind of zany and there are mechanics here that you can use and if the players wanna have fun with them, I say do it, especially, I feel like, I mean, anyone can, but I feel like kids would really appreciate getting on one of these things and trying to figure out how they work and all the weird things they can do. So, yeah, have fun with this one. On to G7, the auto-loading crossbow platform. Now, this one is a bit odd, uh, a bit over the top, and the gnomish inventor Factore, Factory, Factory, I don't know how you pronounce that, but nonetheless, 
Factore is here and decides to test these ballistas on the party as soon as they enter the room. I think that's a little out there, um, but Factory is supposed to kind of just be nuts. And if you want to lean into that, go for it. Um, but a lot of parties are probably not going to want to kill gnomes. And if someone just attacks you for no reason, I see no reason why you wouldn't defend yourself. And if they're trying to avoid killing anybody, this could get a little weird. Nonetheless, run your game the way you want to. But the alternative idea might be she's a little bumbling and... Uh, you know, kind of has this moment where she's like, oh my gosh, I've lost control of the platform. Somebody please help me. You know, whatever you think is going to be fun for your game, I say just roll with it. And if it doesn't make sense, this adventure kind of is in that lane. So just have fun with it. And now for section G8, the Mimic and Mushroom Wine Cellar. So this is where the Mimic is. And the book references eight barrels on the map you can clearly see 12 this really isn't that significant just thought that might be worth mentioning but just pick a barrel roll a d12 roll a d8 however you want to handle that and there you go that's where the mimic is there's really no reason for the group to care much about this room so there's a little disconnect there. However, I think if this is the room that you want to have the Mimic start in, I think it's totally fine. Maybe they find a dead body here. I don't know. Do you have any ideas about how to do that? Comment section. Help us all out. And now we move on to section G9, the guard post. And the two gnomes here are Ula and Pog. Remember Pogs, by the way? Are you old enough to know what a Pog is? I am. These gnomes are supposed to attack anybody that can't prove they're not a shape changer. And that's basically a DC 10 check of whatever kind the party wants to do. Uh, but the thing about this is that if you're going to use the stats for a rock gnome recluse, they actually can be a little bit more dangerous than maybe meets the eye. When you consider that they have access to spells like magic missile, mage armor, and shield, if they have some decent positioning, they could do some nasty stuff, and if you want to, say, substitute some of the spells in the communal spell book, which we'll talk about a little later, you want to drop a spell like sleep? That's, that's kind of a game changer. That almost ends everything right there, and then it gets really interesting. What would, what would gnomes do if they capture the group? Because I don't think they would kill them outright. I think they might just want to know more, their inquisitive nature. But yeah, I think that'd be very interesting to see how that would be handled if you wanted to do that. That could that could be a lot of fun. By the way, I also think it would be perfectly acceptable to have Mage Armor already active, especially if the circumstances of how the group arrives in this room might seem a little suspicious. Plus, I mean, Mage Armor lasts for eight hours, so maybe that's just what they do when they start their shift. I think that makes total sense. And here we are in room G10, the Spinning Blades room. This room is designed to deal damage to anybody that goes through it, whether or not they've made their saving throw. Now, I personally think that's poor design choice. I think it might even be safe to say that I'm not a big fan of how they did that. I know, I know, that was a bad joke. However, that is the kind of a joke that a gnome in this room might make, so feel free to use that. But seriously, I actually am not a fan of how this was designed because it just feels a little incomplete. So this is supposedly an adventure that's designed for level one characters, and a failed saving throw inflicts 4d8 damage on a character, half as much even if they succeed. So even if at best case scenario, if you try and push through this, you're still taking 2d8 damage. That's a lot. Also, the lever in the room is something that the characters should be able to see, and perhaps you want to just let them do that, but they also make a point to mention that there's mist kind of lightly obscuring the entire room, meaning you have disadvantage on any perception checks here. So not only is there this very dangerous threat in the room, the way to turn it off is locked behind a disadvantaged skill check, which they also, by the way, don't give you a DC for, which pretty much everything else in this adventure seems to have a DC of 10, so that seems like a logical place to start, but you do you, boo-boo. So for me, if my group was here and I wanted to have them roll to see if they saw the lever, I would have a friendly gnome show up if they failed to find that lever because I don't know. It just seems 
it just seems weird. Like, why are they doing this? I understand that it's off kilter. I understand that it's gonzo and that's really what gnomes are about. So flavor wise, that does fit. But if the group has been friendly with the gnomes, absolutely have someone come along and help them out because these gnomes also have the mage hand cantrip, which you're not even guaranteed to have to be able to use to turn the thing off. Bad design, if you ask me, it's, it's just how I feel about it. But no matter how you want to handle this room, I would absolutely make sure you emphasize just how dangerous things are here. Especially newer players that might not understand some mechanics and patterns with saving throws. Like if that's foreign to your group, you really need to lean into that. Especially younger players. They're, they're probably just learning the game here. If you want to have some kind of a way to circumvent that, perhaps succeeding on these skill checks and saving throws by five or more might avoid damage altogether. I don't know. You can get creative here, but um, I just think top to bottom, it's a bad room. And now we have arrived at section G11, the inventor's workshop, where Bibble Stib and Dabble Dob are two gnomish inventors arguing over the best way to cure King Korbaz's insanity. Bibble Stib wants to invent a sanity ray and shoot the king, while Dabble Dob wants to invent and use a straitjacket to restrain him. I think those are both perfectly viable ways to go about this, but if you have crazier ideas, uh, the crazier the better, and let them lean into it. Um, the only thing is, I think you probably will find players that are going to say, yeah, one of those sounds great, how do we help? And then you need an answer for that. Which, of course, the adventure gives you, right? In my opinion, I think the best way to handle a question like that would be to say that it's just theory right now that even though those are goals they have, they don't know how to go about putting one together. So it would take too long and that the group needs to continue on trying to figure it out regardless. That, yeah, I think that probably is the best bet. But however you want to handle that situation, Fibblestib and Dabble Dub offer uh, some kind of reward to the group for being able to help with this situation. They have some magic items that they list, like a clockwork amulet, um, things like that. But there also actually is a communal spell book. So if you have a wizard in your party and you want to give them a chance to be able to learn a spell, or really you can add any magic item that you think might be cool to give your players. Maybe you know a certain fantasy they want to have. Whatever it is, this is your chance to kind of up the ante and give some kind of tangible reason for the group to help these gnomes besides to the goodness of their heart. Might be enough for some, but a lot of groups it's not. In room G12, you have the gnome domiciles, and there are eight gnomes just sleeping here. From what I can tell, this really is just filler content, and you actually could have the group enter the whole complex in this section. Uh, but really, uh, you, you could flesh out each one of these if you'd like, and we have a video on how to make great NPCs right here on this channel. As always, I highly recommend our content. But in my opinion here, I would just have a few TV or movie characters in mind that you could just pull from and use interchangeably however you see fit at a moment's notice. And the other thing I think might be fun is you could make them like octuplets or something. And I feel like some players are just going to focus on that, like it's significant in some way. And it's, it's just, just not. In room G13, this actually is the treasury, and only Fibblestib and Dabbledob have a key to unlock it. However, if your group tries to pick those locks, you have the information available to you in the features of the area. But there's just a bunch of junk, gizmos, uh, anything, and any of the reward items, really, I think that the group might be interested in should be in here. And like I said before, add to that if you want. Maybe if you want to find an opportunity to put a silvered weapon in here in case they want to go in that Mountain's Toe gold mine quest later on. If you watch the intro video to this series, you understand why I think that's important. Yeah, you can put that here. You can do whatever you want with this room, but this is where the goodies are. And here we are with the royal section of this video and Nomengard, and that's G14, the throne room. Now, this room, to be honest, really doesn't serve much of a purpose unless some kind of odd combat situation happens, which we all know that players are likely to do from time to time. 
The only thing that's really of significance here is the secret door that leads to the king's bedchamber, and of course, vice versa. Now, the DC to find this is a DC 10, which, really quick design note, they put that in the features area of the book and not here in this section. If you ask me though, I would up the DC probably to a DC 20, a bare minimum a DC 15, but if some weird combat situation does happen and that secret door comes into play, I think unless they did a really great job, it should take the group by surprise. I don't know, I feel like that would just be a better experience. And that brings us to the King's Bedchamber, section G15, where Korbaz has locked himself and Nurkli in the room. Now, of course, there are two keys to open this door, and they're both inside the room because one belongs to each king. So, um, yeah, there's that. If the group wants to talk to King Korbaz through the door, alerts them to their presence somehow, uh, King Korbaz very much tries to talk to the group, and it's very much like, hey, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a shape changer here. It's dangerous. And, you know, if you can kill this thing, great. That's that's great. And I, I will reward you accordingly. And he's he's kind of loopy until he's convinced that the mimic is dead. I don't think he knows it's a mimic, though. He's some kind of shape-changing creature. Oh, and uh, by the way, uh, King Korbaz actually glued King Nurkli to a chair and restrained him. And, uh... Only Korbaz carries a solvent that will dissolve the glue. And I know that we've all done some crazy things uh, <laughs> in the name of love. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's a bit much. So the way that the group can convince King Korbaz that the Mimic has been defeated really is just succeeding on a DC 12 persuasion check if they're telling the truth or deception check if they're lying how the group goes about trying to do that really is on them and you just interpret if it's believable or not i you know I, there's really not much else to it it's it's kind of odd a little bit and a little a little off but that's gnomes so my thoughts on this adventure when i originally prepared for it i found myself rooting for my players not to choose it and actually that is what they did but as i prepared the notes for this video I kind of felt like, you know what, this really would have been a lot more fun than I originally gave it credit for, and there's a part of me that would have liked to have seen how Daisy, Marcus, and Landor would have handled this zany collection of gnomes. I think that would have been fun. If I'm being honest, calling a group of 20 gnomes a kingdom is ridiculous. I mean, I could call myself King of the Night Shift, but that's just, it doesn't make any sense. For me, I actually think I would reflavor it to just be like they're a research team of some kind and they have some guards, they have some researchers, they have leaders, they have other, you know, people in the kitchen, all that kind of stuff. That just seems a little strange to me, but there's a lot of scaling, I think, actually in Dragon of Ice Fire Peak that feels a little off. So at least in that way, it's consistent. And really, you can run it any way and it, it will work. I just... I just can't call a group of 20 anything an entire kingdom. That just doesn't make sense. But other than that, I really think that the information they give you in the packet combined with this video really should give you a framework to run this in a way that you see fit. Because I really think anytime it's, a, whether it's a planned adventure, one you're making of your own volition, I, I really think when you make it your own, that's when D&D shines the most. Because after all, you know your friends better than I ever could. You know your table better than anyone else. And I think that that's, that's the little spark of life that I think is always going to make your game shine more than any specific way of doing something ever could. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video or you're finding it helpful, please give us a thumbs up. And I really would love to know how your experience running Nomengard went. So please head down to the comment section and let me know. Also, we've got the magic item video right here on screen now that I think you should check out, as well as the other videos here in this playlist and, of course, on our channel. So once again, thank you so much for watching. We love you. We hope to see you soon. Take care.